So we have the hypertension, and then we have the um, elevated blood glucose. That, of course, is very much um, going hand in hand with the insulin because glucose is the primary stimulus for insulin. And that's one of insulin's most famous jobs is to try to bring that glucose down. But as the muscles become insulin resistant, that's the main consumer of glucose. Uh, and now it can't pull in as much. It's not pulling in because it's not responding to insulin. Insulin normally tells the liver to hold on to glucose, to store it for later and not to release it when insulin's high, but the liver's getting a little deaf to that signal and now it's releasing glucose when it should be holding on to it. So that explains the hyperglycemia. And then the dyslipidemia, the high triglycerides, boy, insulin tells the liver to make fat and it does so very, very well. So if insulin is up, it's telling the liver to start creating triglycerides and packaging them into the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins to be dumped into the blood with the VLDL and the LDL. Now, mentioning LDL, though, it's, it's conspicuously absent in the metabolic syndrome, which I think is a testament <laughs> to kind of how irrelevant LDL is. Just one more evidence. Then the final point with HDL, insulin accelerates HDL intake back into the liver. And so it, it's forcing the, the liver to be clearing the blood of HDL more rapidly than it would otherwise. So it's just one more evidence of insulin resistance. And then having yeah, maybe gone through go over that a little bit more, mm -hmm. like the de novo lipogenesis, because I think we we don't talk about this enough because as you said, like 95% of cholesterol stuff is LDL, but that's not mm -hmm. actually the most powerful predictor. Like in that cholesterol panel, the classic cholesterol panel of HDL triglycerides and LDL, it is like the weakest link, right? Oh yeah. It's by far and away, and we've known this for a long, long, long time. Um, despite the outsized attention, HDL is, and triglycerides, which actually always go hand in hand, they, they almost always go hand in hand, right? When triglycerides go up, HDL goes down. Um, it's almost like it's, it's far more predictive of future heart disease oh, yeah. than the LDL. Um, so, so maybe mechanistically, it, it might be good to go over sort of fatty liver and over lipogenesis and that packaging you mentioned of the VLDL, because I think mm -hmm. that doesn't get enough yeah. uh, sort of uh, look Attention. at. Attention, yeah. 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 Well, the, the liver, I like to refer to it as the soccer mom of nutrient metabolism because it can <laughs> handle everything that comes at it. And it will, it will hold on, and it's the ultimate giver as well. You know, like if the body, it's sort of sampling the body saying, hey, uh, you're getting a little low on glucose. Well, I've got some here for you and I'm going to give it up. Uh, hey, we need to rearrange and, and store some. F we got extra energy coming in. I'm going to turn it into fat and then I'm going to send that out so that the body can burn it or mm -hmm. store it, um, which which the you know the fat cells can do. So with regards to lipogenesis, the liver can essentially take any excess carbons. Mostly that's going to be from from glucose. But it will only happen if insulin is telling it to. So this, once again, this is another phenomenon where insulin is telling the liver. It's basically able to tell the liver, um, hey, we, we have energy now um, and it's a moment of, of abundance. Let's sort of package this up and concentrate these carbons into a concentrated energy and fat's the most concentrated form of this. So take all these carbons, a lot from glucose, turn it into stored form of fat. And then let's send it to the fat tissue, for example, or to the muscle or anywhere else the body wants to be holding on to or even burning fat. That is lipogenesis, the process of taking some carbons and starting to link them together. But you do not have lipogenesis in the absence of an insulin stimulus. And so insulin will be up and then it tells the liver, make these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. I basically need some vehicles to take these fats around. I'll hold on to some, and so the liver will get fat, but I also need to share some, and, and hopefully the fat tissue will take some of this up, you know, just as an example. And so it will package... So let's, let's, the... let's, uh, yeah, so I think that's a really key point that I just want to emphasize again, too, that it's like you need insulin. This is one of insulin's job, right? It's not mm -hmm. that it's a bad thing. If, if you're, you know, have a lot of food to eat and you're going to be facing a winter of, you know, low food, this is very, very good. This is not 
you know, something insulin is not supposed to be doing. That is his job. The problem is it's too high, right? And and the key is that insulin is a hormone. It's a nutrient sensor. It tells you that food is, you say, is currently right now in abundance. We need to store some away, just like a bear will store mm -hmm. fat for the winter. It's the same idea. It's a good protective mechanism. It's a normal thing. It's just too much of it in the modern world, right? So I think that that's really important because fatty liver is another disease that's gone through the roof, right? So yeah. you have too much glucose, the carbons, and you could have too much protein too, um, but you have all this excess glucose and then a lot of insulin in response and tells the liver, let's store it away. How are we going to store it? Well, we need to make new fat. So mm -hmm. uh, this is de novo lipogenesis, which is de novo means from new, lipogenesis means creation of fat. So it's the creation of new fat from glucose. That's like, that's like the <laughs> verbatim translation yeah. of this. Thing. So it's like, well, obviously if insulin is a key player in de novo lipogenesis, it's going to create all this new fat and you're going to get fatty liver. That's, that's why fatty liver appears all the time in conjunction with, um, you know, the type two diabetes with the epidemic of obesity, with the epidemic of diabetes, because it's also a manifestation of hyperinsulinemia, which gets back to the sort of excess carbs and fatty liver, of course, is now probably the most important liver disease bar none. So 20, 30 years ago, it was sort of down there. Uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C have actually largely receded because of, uh, you know, sanitation and vaccines, uh, you know, um, so those have gone down. And now all you're seeing is a huge wave of epi like a massive epidemic of fatty liver disease, even in children, uh, even in children. Yes. Steatohepatitis is the technical yep. name. And it's like, that's crazy because in 1980, it was actually practically unheard of. Like the first case report started up in uh, in 1980, I think, in fatty liver disease. Uh, it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver because you can get fatty liver with alcoholics. But it was this guy, this janitor, I think, who was drinking 20 Coca-Cola's a day. And he had fatty liver, swore he never oh, drank a drop of alcohol. And they said, wow, this is so interesting. I'm going to publish this. Now, of course, we see it. You know, every second patient has fatty liver disease, right?